welcome to the void. This is the horse racing and handicapping show that embraces chaos. As racing fans are constantly trying to create order out of disorder, learn lessons from our mistakes, and grab from the void that one precious form factor that will deliver us a winner. Um, this week, we're jumping into the void with Mark Kramer, author of multiple handicapping classics as well as books on traveling to out of the way places and cycling for a better life. And what a perfect guest to kick off our first show. Uh, he's a great contrarian thinker and a guy who has no fear of stepping off of terra firma to explore some new ideas. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for jumping into the void with us. Hey, it's an honor to be in the void. <laughs> um, I've talked to you a little about the format of the show which is that we won't have much of a format at all. Uh, the idea is to wander a bit uh, aimlessly in handicapping space and see what we bump into. Um, maybe some old ideas that should be resurrected um, or mistakes that um, we should have learned from. Uh, so with that, um, I have one comment to start us off. Probably more consistently than um, any other financial or economic pursuit, uh, betting on horses rewards contrarian thinking. And uh, you can't get a decent return on investment unless you're thinking uh, more critically or creatively than the people you're betting against. And um, you seem to have made a career of uh, approaching it that way. Well, uh, you know, I think that actually contrarian thinking can help us in many aspects of life because uh, the stuff they give us in school and in the media uh, is it's just uh, for, for mass consumption. So, uh, but horse racing is a laboratory that proves that it works. And then we can transfer it to other parts of our life. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. It's a, it's the transfer to the other parts of life that um, has really interested me and kept me going with it over the years. Um, to be able to take a piece of information um, that either is designed for quick consumption or that people just quickly consume, uh, and then look a little more critically at it or deeper and and find out that it's, it's not correct. Um, you can apply that to so many things in your life, um, you know, from purchasing products to life decisions like um, should I cycle to work or drive to work? Um, you've written a book recently, Old Man on a Green Bike, uh, that does a wonderful job of kind of turning our ideas of, of what a city and what society should look like and, and what they could look like, how they could be better. Yeah, well, uh it's interesting because part of the during the period when I, I was uh, gathering notes for old man on a green bike, uh, which was 19 years of bicycling, uh, a big chunk of that time was bicycling to racetracks because uh, that was com uh, commuting for me. And in fact, uh, when we moved to Paris, we the first place we were living in uh, was was only near uh, one one racetrack. Uh, so we moved to the other side and we, we were in bicycling range of uh, five different tracks. So that was, that was, that was a good contrarian decision that we made. And we're actually slightly outside of Paris. What I discovered about uh, bicycling to work or to the track is that when you're active, when you're using active transportation, you arrive somewhere, your mind is clearer to get the job done, whatever your job is. And especially when it comes to making decisions at the track, uh, but also work decisions. Uh, if, if you have a clear mind, uh, this can, can save you a lot of aggra aggravation. So the bicycling and going to the track have a unique combination for me. And uh, I, I treasure every time I'm going that way. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. And, and you've discovered all kinds of side benefits too. Um, I I commute to work by bike, and um, not only do I get there more wide awake, um, but I find I I don't need that coffee or that espresso every day. So not only is it saving me money on gas and that stuff, it's um it's cutting down some other <laughs> questionable habits. So um, well, the French the French espresso 
for me is a type of doping uh, that I have. <laughs> but usually for the uh, for on the way back, <laughs> not on the way going there, but on the way back. Uh, but um, for example, Longchamp, it takes me about 35 minutes to get there by bike. If I were to take the uh, the metro and the bus, it takes me 50 to 55 minutes. It's actually faster to go there by bike, besides me, uh, uh, much more of a pleasure. So, yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, the, the French espresso, when you're here in Paris or any of your listeners, first thing we do is go have a cup of coffee there you'll, together and you'll see that it uh, makes a difference. Oh yeah. I have no objections to that. Um, you, you know, the, um, one racetrack within biking distance to me is, was, um, was Portland Meadows. They just, uh, knocked that down about six months ago. And, uh, right now there's a big Amazon warehouse and distribution facility there instead. Um, so biking to the track has kind of been removed as an option for me, unless I want to bike, uh, 270 miles up to Seattle, um, but I might try that someday. I think, uh, Roger, that uh, you're ahead of me in the standings of uh, biking or visiting defunct racetracks. I think you've, <laughs> you've seen two more than I have, uh, but uh, uh, if any listener out there has uh, seen, has been to more than 15 defunct racetracks, then you might uh, qualify to win whatever award we can we can find from uh, Kyle's uh, living room there. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll grab it. We'll grab you a plant and give you the uh, kiss of death award. Um, so yeah, I've, I started early. I've, uh, I started around age 12 going to the racetracks in New England, which had a pretty lively circuit um, through Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, from Narragansett Park in Rhode Island and, and Lincoln Downs uh, to Suffolk Downs in Massachusetts, Rockingham Park, New Hampshire. Sure. Um, and they all decided to um, be devout capitalists and compete against each other instead of just sticking with their their assigned race, their state assigned race states. Uh, There's a little plug for socialism there. Uh, and they all went down the tubes. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's too bad. I mean, we might have been uh, uh, that you and I were at Suffolk the same day without knowing it. <laughs> so that was a long time ago. Yeah, I um, I lived in Las Vegas for a little while and I was in a race book there. I met a guy who was from Massachusetts who used to go to Suffolk regularly. And um, he said to me, um, he said, hey, were you there the day the, the guy ran onto the track because his horse was losing and started waving his hands in, in front of the horses down the stretch to get the race declared void. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> I was there that day, coincidentally. So. Hey, uh, you know, that's the second time I've heard a story like that because here in France, uh, we had some friends who were, who were also living here at the time from Maryland and they had never gone to a racetrack. So I took them to the jumpers at Auteuil, which was uh, Ernest Hemingway's favorite track. And we were standing in the infield and you know how the jumpers, they start from a standing position and there was a false, what should have been a false start. Three horses were left and didn't get off. And the starter failed to call a false start. And so the horses were running around with three horses that were automatically eliminated. And one of them was the betting favorite. Oh, man. And, they, and they had to go t twice around and they actually went through the mess and but the second time, before they went the second time around, people right next to where we were standing charged onto the track. <laughs> One guy led the, led, led the cavalry. They charged onto the track. And remember, I had friends with us. It was their first time to ever see a horse race. And this is what they saw. And uh, my horse won the race, but all tickets were returned because it was an illegitimate race all tickets were returned to the public and uh it was an amazing moment seeing uh this uh, the french uh rebellious attitude that comes from the paris <laughs> commune of 1870 <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say i'm surprised the whole city of paris didn't get out into the streets over the false start because <laughs> protests and horse racing are bigger there right <laughs> uh, that's right yeah. that's right <laughs> um so we were you know one possible uh thing uh 
that I'd be interested to talk about here is uh, finding value because that is uh, the real contrarian challenge, um, especially you had a boom in handicapping books through the uh, starting probably in the late seventies with Andy Byers books. Um, I know handicapping books go back further than that, like Ainsley's uh, great works. Um, but through the eighties, particularly a lot of, a lot of good handicapping literature came out, a lot of good computer studies and um, it made it a little harder to find value. Um, one example that comes quickly to mind. I mentioned in my book is uh, James Quinn's handicappers condition book. Uh, one of the easiest uh, things that you could apply from that book were maiden droppers. Uh, so horses running in maiden special weights who um, didn't do that well, got get dropped into a maiden climber. Um, I could remember when, shortly after finishing that book, um, finding two maiden droppers that paid $90, like within a, within a two month span, probably. And I can't tell you, it's probably been 10 years since I've cashed a $90 horse. Um, but, um, that angle, just more people found out about it. And, um, it's not kind of the automatic bet that it used to be. So do you find it's more of a challenge to find value and where do you look for value? Well, uh, in Quinn's book, in the Handicapper's Condition book, which I think is one of the best ever uh, books written, and it was his first, uh, and there still are value things that I look for. When I, when I travel to the States and I go to a racetrack, and I haven't been for a long time, but I haven't been following them every day, I look at these uh, races, non-winners of two, two lifetime, non-winners of, uh, of two since uh, six months ago, et cetera. And the lightly raced horses, not automatically, it's not an automatic bet, but usually you can find lightly raced horses racing against horses that are proven losers. And you can get some uh, good, good bets on that. And sometimes you can also find a horse that seems like he's a proven loser, but you can draw a line through three or four of his starts as being wrong distance, wrong surface. And it turns out he's not a proven loser. Yeah. And that would, that would apply to Quinn's book. But here in, here in France, for example, to, to find value, it's hunting and searching for value, I call it. It's sort of like going back to the hunter-gatherer period of, <laughs> uh, of uh, evolution. And uh, the, the best that I have, that I use uh, today, are things that maybe you would think seem really foreign to you, but they've become household to me. And that is uh, in, the, in the trotters, have you played the trotters, Roger? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I grew up um, pretty much a stone's throw from a harness track. So, um, yeah, I spent a fair amount of time playing them. Not recently, but in the past, yeah. Well, with the trotters in France, they have particular races of trotters on grass. Yeah. And when you have the trotters on the grass, the public is just looking at their, their form. And I'm looking which ones have the best grass records and which ones hate the grass. You can find a horse that just won three ra three races on the dirt, switching to grass. And if you go back into his past performances, you discover that he's over over five on the grass, and so you can throw him out, and he's the favorite. Yeah. Uh, I lost my bet this Sunday on one of those because I needed the five first finishers, and I got the four without the fifth. But one of those finishers was one hundred and nine to one, finished uh -huh. third, precisely on that angle. So I, I didn't feel bad about uh, what I had done with that race. And the other type of race, which is both thoroughbreds and uh, harness trotters, is because they don't pace here, is um, amateurs, races for amateur, dry, uh, amateur jockeys. Yeah. And because amateur jockey race, the public is just handicapping by basic uh, procedures, but suddenly the jockey factor becomes the number one factor in all. And so I study the jockeys in those races and I go to them immediately to, to, to look for, for value as opposed to just any old race. So this was really hunting and gathering to find, to find this value. <laughs> yeah, that that's a great. And, um, and you talking about restricted races, uh, since Quinn's book came out, that was published in what, like 1982 or so, um, so. handicappers condition book. Um, there hasn't, I don't think um, there's ever been a revised edition of that. But when you look at conditions at the racetrack, 
Um, there are a lot of new and strange conditions. I have been seeing lately a lot of um, hey, races that are essentially starter allowance races, but they're listed as allowance. So it's an allowance for non-winners of two lifetime, but for horses that have started for a claiming price of 30000 or less in the past year. Uh, now, no one's ever analyzed that. Do you Do you handicap that as a starter allowance race? Or do you handicap that as an allowance race? And what's the more effective method? So I think if someone kind of looked at these new and complicated conditions that are being applied to both allowance and uh, claiming races, that uh, you could probably come up with with a um, very um, profitable way of looking at those. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, the uh, Quinn's ideas uh, can apply to those races. and. Um, I used to go when they initiated the claiming crown in, in Canterbury Park. I used to go every summer to, to attend the claiming crown there. And almost all the races in the claiming crown were exactly these conditions you're talking about. Oh. They, they were starter allowance for horses that had run. Sometimes you, a horse that had run for 5000 claiming price and now it was a starter allowance. And that, that might have been in the way in the beginning of the year. And uh, the race might have been following a, a six-month layoff, and it just didn't count. And so you can you can find value in those races. I, I don't know if the, I haven't followed the claiming crown uh, since I've uh, been paying closer attention to French racing. I don't know if they still have it or not. Um, I think they do. Although you know, last year a lot of things got canceled, and uh, I'm not sure what has been canceled permanently and what was just canceled um, because of COVID. Um, but I also, I just, before I forget, I wanted to mention, um, I'm doing that video series says, you know, instant value handicapping, uh, on YouTube. And one of the first winners that I had in that series happened to be, um, a value angle from your book, Thoroughbred Cycles, where the horse had been, uh, claimed on, uh, a raise in claiming price. And you mentioned in that book, um, what a powerful endorsement that is that the trainer is willing to pay more than the horse has been running for typically, um, that he thinks that much of the horse and, uh, and it, and it worked out. I think the, I think that was a $19 winner that I had. Uh, a good shot. I, I think that it's amazing how many, uh, horse racing has changed so much, but so much of it is still what it, what it used to be. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I, I'm going to do a, a video shortly um, talking about how, so much as how it used to be. Um, oh. I, I try to um, I try to gauge both my books and the videos to maybe attract new players. People are unfamiliar with the sport. And I find that the most common question I get from newcomers is like, why do they measure it in furlongs or why do they do this or that? And, it's, and I'm thinking like, well, I mean, they measure it in furlongs in case like a time traveler comes from the 1880s and <laughs> wants to go to the racetrack. Um, but <laughs> um, so anyway, it'd be fun to kind of go through all of all of the different terminology in the sport and kind of a fun way to um, introduce people to it. Well, you mentioned uh, racing back in the 80s. Uh, the 80s, perhaps not the best time in American history, but um, for horse racing, it was a great time. And, yeah. and uh, I, I wrote a novel uh, at that time called Please Hold All Tickets. That was basis, basically a, a travel, a horse racing travel novel where these guys go across the country trying to beat the races and go from one track to another. And, um, and I realized that at that time, being at the track, being by the rail, uh, or or uh, watching him in the paddock, it, it was a, it was part of the meaning of my life. And when everything is online nowadays, it's it's just not the same thing as uh, so. It's sort of like a retro view of what racing was like in the 1980s, including many real people who are in the book. And I'm hoping that maybe uh, there's something we can do to bring back. Uh, the idea of being in person at the track and uh, and enjoying the spectacle too, besides playing. 
Oh, uh, yes, I, I would love to be able to contribute at least a little to uh, a trend in that direction. Uh, we've both you've mentioned Canterbury Park and uh, how you've been there a lot. And it sounds um, like they are probably managed similarly to Emerald Downs in Seattle. They're, they're small racetracks that um, have done a great job at catering to handicappers and to the general public. I know uh, Emerald would run a promotion called Wallet Day where they give out free wallets and a certain number of them have $200 in them. And, and there'd be lines like the length of the parking lot, people waiting to get in. Uh, so, you know, it's some clever marketing and, um, and adding more fun to the whole experience. Um, I think uh, I think tracks can get there and um, Canterbury Canterbury was, is was and I, I assume it still is a real classy place for that. And I remember those Thursday and Friday night uh, crowds. I mean, the track was full. People were having a great time. They had a band there. Uh, the betting was always interesting. The races were interesting and uh, and the place was um, was just comfortable. Everybody was in good spirit, and this is this is what I love. I, I just uh, I'm going to do something to bring this back. Yeah, well, I can uh, keep telling uh, keep telling stories of the old days, right? <laughs> um, part of it is you kind of can remember my dad. Um, he had read a lot of handicapping books, but he had never been around horses in his um, personal life. And he was at the track one day standing by the rail watching the post parade and this guy starts talking to him and he was the um ex uh track veterinarian and he basically gave my dad a um a, a little class on uh horse body language and and how to um how to spot both a healthy horse and possible little infirmities and kind of interpret how they were feeling and uh it was a real educational experience for somebody who hadn't spent any time around animals. And uh, uh, so things like little surprises like that happen at, at the track and, and you, you, can, uh, you can get into wonderful conversations with people who really love and know horses. Well, the beautiful thing about, uh, uh, I, I don't like to use the word retro because this could be something in the future too. Uh, but we have a lot of infrastructure in the USA, racetrack infrastructure that's still there and it, it's the kind of thing that if um, maybe when people have been sitting around stuck at home during during the pandemic and they finally get out, maybe the, there'll be a renewal. I, just just think of uh, the, the sense of place of Fockers Corner at Santa Anita, where you watch the workouts in the morning, get a cup of coffee, have a great breakfast. Uh, you're sitting amongst the trainers, the, the jockeys who are, who are not uh, working out at the moment. And uh, many tracks have these these places that uh, maybe you mentioned that I did travel writing, but I it's travel writing, but it's a writing that uh, revolves around sense of place. And we, we will not be the same uh, species if we lose our sense of place. And so it's not only racetracks, but it's just getting out, out there and doing things outdoors and doing things in person and having a, having a sense of place of where we are. And the same thing for the way communities are built that have destroyed, uh, destroyed our sense of place by, uh, uh, by requiring everybody to, to, to drive a car in order to go and get a loaf of bread because nothing's within walking distance. So I think that uh, maybe overall, this is a struggle to, to recover the idea of sense of place. Yeah. in the bigger picture, I definitely see that. And, um, and that's something, uh, that's something that, um, we should be more aware of and, um, and look for opportunities. I, I know that you've, um, been in some battles to fight zoning laws um, in places you've lived before. And um, my wife is actually beginning that struggle here where we live. Um, it's uh, kind of being overtaken by development and development of the worst kind where um, they, you know, want to change two lane roads to four lane roads and single family houses to uh, either McMansions or um, larger 
larger, more dense dwellings. Um, so, and it, it's tough to find people who are willing to step out of their living rooms and take up that fight, even if they're hundred percent in agreement. Um, so, yep. It's something, uh, well, it's, a public needs health, approach. it's a public health issue too, because, um, you know, people talk about getting exercise and I'm not going to put down people who do exercise because exercise is a good thing. But for many of us, exercise is boring activity, uh, tedious and repetitive. Uh, but the way we evolved as a human species uh, was through exercise. But the exercise had a meaning to it. I talked about the hunting and gathering, uh, even agriculture, you grow things, you do a garden, that's exercise. And so there's something they call purposeful exercise that is just doing things uh, that, that need to be done in a, in a pleasant way. And this is what is missing from the way communities are designed. They're, they're not designed to be pur purposeful. And in fact, I don't know, uh, with, with kids that we used, to, we used to walk to school or ride our bikes to school. And it was good. It's good for, it's part of the exercise. Now, uh, there, there are more health problems with kids because they're driven to school by their parents who become chauffeur. And uh, there's traffic jams outside the school and once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Uh, they, these are uh, aberrations. I think they're aberrations. And yeah. uh, we need an anthropologist to step in and see what's <laughs> happening with our culture. You know? uh, yeah, def definitely. Um, the um, I, I want to give you a chance too before we wrap up um, to to um, tell people where they can buy um, your book, Old Man on a Green Bike. I, I've read it a couple of times, and I have to say that you bring uh, as much um, new information and interesting information to both cycling and um, and uh, the redesign of cities as you did to handicapping literature throughout your career. It's just a fascinating book. Um, I, I learned a lot and, um, and I, and I strongly encourage people who uh, enjoy your work to check that out too. Well, the, the subtitle of the book uh, is Chronicles of a Self-Serving Environmentalist. And I don't know about everybody listening, but I was, wasn't an environmentalist when I thought environmentalist was, environmentalism was a sacrifice. Uh, but then I discovered that self-serving environmentalism is the type of actions that one does for one's own benefit. Exercise for health, for example, instead of taking the car to buy, buy a loaf of bread, taking the bike or walking. Uh, so this is why I call it self-serving environmentalism. To me, there's no contradiction between uh, loving our earth and loving ourselves as human, human beings. And so uh, there are many adventures. The book is really uh, a bunch of stories and they go from urban quality of life and commuting, including a lot of misadventures that you can learn from. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't do it right in the beginning, you know? It was like, uh, I was the one that was the guinea pig, so other people can do it right. Uh, but yeah. also there were, the, the, the human body is something that uh, needs to be challenged. And we're forgetting about that. Some of us are, we're forgetting about that. And I discovered by cycling, at 13,000 feet above sea level in La Paz, 12,000 to 13,000 in La Paz, Bolivia, on uh, uphills, that it was, it was possible for me to do things that I thought I was incapable of doing uh, by using an in incremental approach. So I think that the book, even though it looks like it's a book about bicycling, and it is for sure, it's also a book about empowerment. And uh, so I recommend uh, at least you take a look. You can actually read the, read the introduction for free by clicking old man on a green bike. Make sure it's old man on a green bike because if it's old man on a bike, that's somebody else's book. Also a good book, by the way. Also a good book. Old man on a green bike, Kramer. Just uh, click in my name, Kramer with a C. Go to Amazon and where it has look inside 
you can click and you can read the, uh, the introductory uh, chapter and it doesn't cost you a penny. I guarantee, and, and I, I, I challenge you if, you, if if it doesn't make you laugh at least one time, then your money back for something that didn't cost you anything to begin with. <laughs> All right. Well, um, th th there's value for you <laughs> right there. Um, so I guess I will leave it at that, Mark. It's, uh, it was a pleasure yeah, talking with you and, um, and uh, sharing your thoughts on, on a number of things, even uh, well beyond uh, the racetrack.